swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. We are all about the entrepreneurs of endurance. Today, everybody, we are going to talk about a passion for chasing monster goals. We're going to talk about commitment and how to create positive change in how you feel about yourselves. To do this, we're joined by a special guest today. She's a wife, a mom, an artist, an entrepreneur, adventurer, and you won't get this from looking at her photographs, but she's also a grandma. She's a two-time finisher of Ironman with goals of qualifying for Kona, president of a real estate investment firm, founder of a new line in cycling sportswear, all the way from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Victoria Shannon, welcome to the show. Thanks, Graham. Awesome to have you here, Victoria. You've just got back from St. George, Utah, one of your recent adventures. Tell us a little bit about that. You were down at the Ironman race there. I was. I was. Yeah, uh, this was my second year going for the St. George 70.3, and it was a bit different this year coming off of an ankle injury. I uh, I ended up relaying with my husband, so I have a little bit of mixed feelings about oh. that, but about not doing the whole race myself. But it was a fantastic experience. I, I love that course and how close you get to the pro race there, and they always have a really deep pro field at that one. So it was fantastic and exciting. And Utah is, it's just paradise. So mm. any excuse to go there is a good one. Well, the scenery is amazing, isn't it? And I don't know, what, oh. what is the bike course hilly? Is it a flat course? No, it is not a flat course. <laughs> it's, tough. it's a tough course, but just absolutely stunning. Amazing. So you mm -hmm. said that you, you had to do the relay with your husband. I, I wonder as well, I mean, I, a lot of the guests I talk to on Endurance FM, when they do races, there's always some kind of unfinished business. Do you feel that? I mean, like with this race, now you have unfinished business, you've got to go back and do it again next year? I absolutely do. Yeah. 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 All right, then. Well, we'll talk about your future plans as well with some of the races that you have on your calendar because it's a crazy calendar packed with challenges. We talk about those monster goals coming up. But one thing I want to know, Victoria, is how you get this done. You're president of a real estate investment firm. You're founder of a, a startup in cycling sports, which we'll talk about in a minute. And now you are training for Ironman. And you've got this goal of qualifying for Kona as well. How do you get it done? How do you, I mean, I don't understand. I mean, I'm semi-retired. So 15 hours training a week for me is a lot of, is a big deal. But how do you do that on top of a 40 or 50 hour work week? I think a lot of it comes down to organization, prioritizing. And I'm so fortunate, and this is a great entrepreneurial thing, to have so much flexibility in my schedule that... You know, I'm, I'm not a straight up nine o'clock to five o'clock. Uh, so I have a lot of flexibility at work. But I would say that actually the first thing for me is prioritizing because when I get my program from my coach, that is that set in stone appointments that I have. So I'm a 5 a.m. or seven days a week. And uh, I always get a, a training session in before work and typically get one in after work. So and I don't have little kids at home, which kind of makes that easier too. I thought mm -hmm. lots of time. And, uh, you know, we've shuffled things around a lot in the workplace. And like a huge thing is just putting a shower in at work so I can go train and shower at work. And I sort of live in a place where if I just drove to work without training first, I would sit in traffic for up to an hour. But instead, I drive into town at 530 in the morning. And so my commute ends up being about 12 minutes. So I mean, right there, I feel like I've made 48 minutes of free time. So mm. Uh, but yeah, flexible at work. So sometimes I'll run at lunch or I'll shift my hours around and I'll work in the evening and go do a, you know, a coached swim session at four o'clock. So lots of uh, flexibility there and making it highest on the priority list. Right. So you've made conscious changes about your lifestyle and you've sort of, you've 
created the the business around that right or your work around that that must have been pretty hard because it seems that most people do it the other way around right you know work comes first and then lifestyle fits into the the remaining hours but you sort of done it the other way around was that yeah. easy for you from the get-go no it totally wasn't and you know at the beginning it just felt like I was just stuffing more and more in hmm. but then it sort of became clear that it needed to mesh more. And it goes along with um, some beliefs that I have about the workplace and happy, fulfilled people being the most effective, productive um, workforce or, or teammates. Mm. And once I kind of realized that and, and went, hey, let's bring this healthy fitness lifestyle into the office and find ways to improve everyone's health and happiness and personal life. And it turned into this huge boost in effectiveness and productivity. It was kind of a light bulb went on and no, it wasn't easy at first and it's taken us a long time to kind of sort things out and how it all works. But it, we've seen huge changes in the way people are performing at work and getting healthier and fitter. Hmm. So, uh, were, you, so, were you leading that change? Were you the one going in there, sort of banging the drum for all that? Yes. Right. Yeah. That must be hard, right? Because a lot of the entrepreneurs I speak to on this radio show, they always face resistance. That's part of being an entrepreneur or even an athlete because you choose, a, I suppose, a, a, a lifestyle of a social misfit in a way that you choose not to hang out in the bar at 10, 10 p.m. on a Friday night, or you, you choose to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning. So you're going to change the people that you hang around with. And, you know, when you go into work and start talking about these kind of things, some people don't get it, do they? I mean, I'm just thinking about other people listening to this. They may be facing a similar situation. How would you sort of advise them that, you know, they're not crazy? Yeah, well, and you really hit it on the head. My whole social set changed. And it surprised me that I lost friendships or that relationships changed because people didn't understand what I was doing or felt mm. that I had prioritized other things above them, which was true. And, you know, but I was equally surprised by the way that I felt support from other sections or people in my life who, you know, I didn't necessarily expect that from, but I did get very lucky. Like, I have such an amazing team at Hans Braun, really just amazing people who have never done anything but support me and, and raise me up. And it's something that we all consciously do for each other. Um, so part of that is that I, I had an amazing team there, but outside of work, the tribe changed mm. big time. Isn't that interesting? That's the hardest part in a way, isn't it? Because leaving people behind is never yeah. easy, is it? I mean, what? tell us a little bit about that. I think maybe we need to put this into context of where you were a few years back. I mean, in your own words, you said you were morbidly obese, antidepressant taking, wine guzzling, chain smoking, couch potato. Yeah. I mean, that's not the kind of resume of an Iron Man finisher, is it? So what's going on? Tell us a little bit about that scene in your life and then also, you know, how that changed for you. Yeah, I, um, that is exactly what I was. I really had gotten myself to a very unhealthy place. I was lots of fun. Um, and I just knew it had to change. And, and really the, the original catalyst for change was just wanting people to have a higher opinion of me and, and wanting to lose weight because I was, I did, I lost a hundred pounds. So that's a significant amount of weight. And I, once I made the decision and a friend who was in a similar situation said to me, like, I'm just done with this life. I'm going to change my life. I signed up for Tough Mudder and I said, I'll do it too. And mm -hmm. so will Brad, my husband, <laughs> I just signed him up. And, you know, and we got all about that and we changed our eating. I quit smoking. I do still love to have a glass of wine, but it's few and far between. And, you know, everything changed and I started getting up at five o'clock in the morning because that's what I had to do to get the training in at that point, just working out because it's a necessary evil of losing weight. And, you know, 
I, I couldn't believe the pushback I was getting from certain people in my life. And finally, my I didn't know how to put words on it. And finally, my husband said to me, he goes, do you just kind of feel like we're not really good enough if we're not drunk and we're going home at nine o'clock? Wow. Like, you, and I said, yeah, you know what? That's exactly how I feel. Like we would still go to stuff, but we wouldn't drink and we would leave early because we had an early wake up call. And it's like, that wasn't good enough for the people we we're hanging out with. So we, you know, we kind of stopped mm -hmm. and now we hang out with people who want to get up at five o'clock and ride bikes all day. Right. <laughs> Isn't that interesting how that happens? One of the recent guests that I had on the show, Victoria, was Greg McDermott, who, um, Aussie that. guy, cycled 14,000 kilometers around Australia. But he was saying that when, you know, he was overweight, he decided to change his life. And when he did that, he went through this transformation, but his friends set up a Facebook page, which was called Bring Back Old Greg or Bring Back Fat Greg or something like that. Because, you know, Old Greg was a lot more fun. He used to hang out with his mates and get drunk on a Saturday afternoon. And he faced that kind of resistance. That must be really hard. Did you face anything like that similar? It may not have been direct, but, you know, kind of the things that people may have said. Yes. You know, I had uh, a situation with, uh, this was at the very beginning, and my husband had gone out with a very, very good friend of ours for the friend's birthday, and they came home drunk. And I was up, and I was sober. And, you know, the friend kind of started at me and just going, you know, you never call, you know, you know just giving mm. me a hard time. And I kind of diffused it. I'm going, yeah, he's drinking. Okay, whatever. And then he did it again. And I kind of diffused it again. And on the third time, when he said to me, you know, you're just not a very good friend. And you're just putting your health before our friendship. Wow. And on and on. And I said, yeah, I am. Wow. <laughs> you know, like, and yes, he was drunk. And I don't necessarily believe that that means that, you know, you didn't mean it. Maybe you didn't mean to say it. But, uh, you know, that caused a void in that relationship that we've never recovered from. Mm. And so I, I have had a few things like that. And I take that hard. I really put high value on the relationships in my life and, and my friendships. And it took me a long time to get over that until I realized, you know what, like, look at these people who are in my life who are just doing nothing but loving me and supporting me. And that's where I need to be. And, and slowly our lives morphed into those are the people that we spend time with. And we race yeah. together, we train together. And, we, you know, we have common interests and, and lifestyle and mostly a huge need to support each other. Just so, How yeah. is that now? You've, you've consciously redefined your tribe, which is a core part of this, isn't it? I mean, you talk about getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning and training together. How do you support each other in that context? I mean, compared to obviously the people who say, you know, you're not a good friend anymore. You're not drunk with us and hanging out. What are the, What does your new tribe behave like? You know, it's the... I, I get a little chuckle when my phone chimes at 517 because who on earth texts somebody at 517 other than your training partner who knows your ankle's been bugging you and wondering if you're still okay to run this morning? You know, like, I love that. I, and the way that we take care of each other and the way that, you know, just – show our care for each other by knowing what's important to us and knowing what we've got coming up. Like, you know, I've got a big run plan today and my ankle's bugging me. The fact that you know that and you thought about me at five o'clock in the morning, you know, that's just this whole triathlon community. It's blown my mind because that's what the people are like. Yeah. Yeah. So true, isn't it? And they don't have to do anything for you necessarily, but just by, you know, saying things or the examples that they set, they all raise us up, don't they? They teach us to lift our game and that yeah. becomes the norm, right? Yeah, it sure does. And you know, one thing I didn't expect because I mean, I'm not so speedy. You know, I would say I'm a bit of a beginner and I look up to these people who are like winning the age groups. So, you know, the people like Steph Corker. Yeah, right. And, 
you you come into this community feeling like you know you're the junior guy kind of for lack of a better word mm -hmm. but you know it's not like that when you're in it it's just like you're all peers yeah it's, yeah so it's really fantastic so true well we'll talk about some of your your goals within that community in a minute because i think that's really important in terms of where you're heading as well something that you, you said to me off air victoria you said about you know one thing that losing weight and transforming your health has taught you was about giving you the courage to say what i want to say giving you the courage to say what you want to say and you talked about that moment with the friend and you know you said you put health okay. first how important it was now to think about your life and your goals and so on and on top of that you're you're an artist as well so the way i'm taking this is this new startup that you're working on because this sounds really fascinating you, your yeah. main passions you the game of business triathlon and art yeah. and how all of these are, are coming together in this startup that's being born tell us a little bit about the idea and what's going on okay uh we are i am i'm working on this with my coach jasper blake we um Last year, I worked with him on coming up with some new kits for his coaching company, and we, we sort of stumbled onto the idea of using an original painting as the artwork on our cycling and tri gear last year. And things sort of spiraled from there to the point where we went, hey, like, this could be really great. There's nothing else out there like it. Um, for me as an artist and an athlete, there's just so many parallels um, that I think are, are so exciting and so wonderful that it just, it, it's just this awesome, exciting venture. And I know from myself and every other cyclist and triathlete, we love to wear really cool gear, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Oh yeah. I'm always looking for something different. And the story is a big deal for me. And you know, the story that an artist puts on a canvas or the story that an athlete leaves out there on the race course is just this, it's like their uninhibited passion. It's, it's a, an expression of that. And, and an artist and an athlete are both doing exactly the same thing. So to bring that art to life on the human canvas, I think is like really appropriate and cool. And we're gonna have some really amazing looking kits. How do you do that? How do you express that story through a cycling jersey? I mean, most of what I see out there on the road, Victoria, is, is walking billboards, isn't it? You know, with yeah. every single mobile phone company on the, the yeah. jersey. What, what are you doing? Well, what we're doing, we're using a different, we'll have a different collection every year and we'll have a different artist every year. So this year we're working with, uh, an uh, artist called the Woodpile Collective, which is actually three local guys who paint together on the same canvas at the same time. So we sat down with them and we talked about art and we talked about sports and we had this really passionate conversation about what we do and we commissioned them to do a piece for us. And the piece came back and they entitled it Dedication as a nod to the heart and soul that we all leave out there. And they, it's, it's really, really cool uh, painting that they've done. And um, so where we go from there is we're, when we, we do our launch event, we're going to auction off that piece of art. And the proceeds from that are going to go to a local art program. And you know, then sort of the cycle starts again. And we really want to give artists the chance to put their work out there. Hmm. So we're not going with, you know, somebody you'd buy in a gallery, but we're finding local talent and, and people who are, you know, just so passionate about what they're doing as we are. How does it feel when you wear one of those jerseys and somebody comes up to you and asks you what it is or what, what's it about? Oh, so good. It's so good. I just, and that's what I find. People love the story. Hmm. You know, the story of the athlete or the story of the artist. The, it's, yeah, it's so much positive feedback we got on last year's stuff. So we're really stoked to, to put out our new stuff this year. Because you don't usually hear any kind of comparisons 
between art and athleticism or art and sport, do you? They're usually kind of different worlds, especially, you know, at school, you're either an artist or you're a sporty person. You don't usually have people who are good at both or they're not necess- They're not obviously connected. Where, where do you find that connection in your own life? Well, for me, and I know endurance athletes will appreciate this, it's, you know, we're always searching for that flow state. Hmm. And where we're fully engaged and firing on all cylinders. And I get that when I'm painting. And I get it when I'm running long Hmm. distance. And it's, you know, it's the same. It's the same feeling. And, you know, like I said, I, I think it's just like uninhibited expression. And it's not very often in life, in your everyday life, where you just can get that out. And I I ran across something, and I, I hope that I'm saying this right, but I thought it was a good analogy, but I did not realize that sound and light are the same. Hmm. It's like a different frequency of the waves. Right. You know what I mean? And you're like, and I think that's what um, art and sport are. It's just like different frequencies of the same thing. So when you're running, you get into this flow state. Are you, so when you're doing a race, are you in a flow state? Because I know a lot of people, Victoria, who race, whether it's endurance like Ironman or it's the obstacle course racing. And for them, it's kind of like the only moment they really enjoy is the end <laughs> when they've got it done and they pick up the medal. Everything else was kind of a, a grind. But yeah. for you, are you sort of able to step out of that a little bit? Yeah, I've learned to love I, at the very beginning. All I wanted when I said I when I committed to do an Ironman, I just wanted to cross the finish line. And it was a bucket list thing. Yeah. And that was all it was about was the finish line. And in the time between when I committed to doing it, and when I actually did it, everything changed, my whole why changed. And what I have come to love is the journey. Like the actual, you journey far in an Ironman physically, Hmm. what you see, like you go far, it's this adventure that you're on and that's really cool. And so is the whole long period of training. You know, you go through, through so many different things and, and I love that. And what I have come to realize in different things that I do is like the longer, the better for me, that Hmm. long journey that long race that long day is it's just really i it's quiet there that's hmm. where it was, that's my soul on fire like all the crap that doesn't matter in life kind of falls away when you're suffering and out there doing right. an iron and uh you know what's important to you and that's what's in my head it's a really grateful place for me that's interesting, isn't it? You use that word suffering in a positive way. I think that's something only really we understand. I know friends or family would look at what I do and say, are you actually enjoying that? <laughs> I don't know if enjoying is the right word to use, but you're right. There's something There's something in there, isn't there? That's suffering. It kind of, you'd rather have that than nothing. Yeah. And that nothing is kind of that comfort of that comfortable existence that we kind of fall into, isn't it, by default? Yeah. yeah. And the challenge as well. I mean, talking about challenges, why on earth would you decide to take on a new project as well as some of your Ironman goals, as well as a full-time job? Why would you take on a startup? Because a startup's never easy anyway, so. Are you not well, busy enough already? Yeah, yes, I am. But, uh, you know, I guess... Because, you know, I never stopped to actually ask myself that because I had the idea once I figured out last year when I was helping Jasper with the kits, I'm like, oh, this is how it works. You know what? I'm going to start making my own kits and I'm going to be wearing gear out there that not another single person in the whole wide world has. That was mm. my plan. And uh, and then we got together and went, hey, like we should do this. There was never a question of should I do this? Because this is the first time that I've taken on a a business venture that is about what I'm passionate about. So Mm. I never had the question, should I do it? Uh, 
it just makes me so happy. And one day, Graham, I'm going to be semi-retired like you, and I'm going to be traveling around, adventuring, training, racing with my laptop, doing art, and doing that stuff remotely. I mean, it also fits into what my future picture is. Mm. Love it. Well, let's talk about some of your dreams. You have big dreams, and I believe you're an ambitious person. So let's talk about those, because those will inspire Kona. You're also talking about an expedition length adventure race at some point, an ultra Gobi. (laughs) You're not picking like anything that's easy, are you? You're probably some of the biggest challenges on the earth. Where do you want to start? Which one of those do you want to talk about first? I want to talk about Ironman because of all the stuff that I do and plan to do, like Ironman is the main thing Mm. for me. And uh, that honestly, from where I started to getting to my first Ironman, that was not as big of a journey as it will be from me to get here to the world championships. So, I mean, I'm no speedy out there. I'm a 15 hour Iron Man, so I'm getting all my money's worth out of that. <laughs> and the, but you know, here's the thing, Graham. Like I've never done sports, so I'm not one of these stories you read in Runner's World about. Hey, guy, yeah, just I'm brand new. I decided to do a marathon. Oh yeah, but I ran track in college, and I mm. really struggled and did a 320 marathon. Like that's not me. But I need to. I need to become a better runner, and I'm a pretty good cyclist and I know that I have a lot of potential there and I'm right where I should be for somebody who's only been swimming for three years. So it's going to take me some time to get there. And I know that. So I figured in these coming up years where it's not a reality for me to get to Kona, I'm going to fulfill some of my other dreams like running an ultra and an expedition length adventure race, because those are things that are going to make me a better runner. Yeah. So that's how I'm looking at it. But Ironman is my thing and getting to that world championship. I'm going to get there. Is that top of the pyramid for you in terms of your, your at least your challenge goals, your sports yeah. goals, right? Ironman yeah. World Championships Kona. Yeah. How do you think you're going to get there? Because, I mean, I don't think in those terms because, you know, I haven't set that as a goal for myself. But obviously you're far more ambitious than I am, Victoria. What do you, you I know you said you, you've got to become a better runner. Right. Well, yeah. To what extent do you feel that you've got to up your game? Is it just a case of continuing the plan or do you need to kind of do something else? Do you need to have a paradigm shift here to get to Kona? Um, I think it's a matter of continuing the plan. So, I mean, starting from nothing and here I am, you know, four years in from zero fitness. It, it's just it has to be further along the path because... I'm just not that caliber of an athlete yet, but I do know that I will get there. When you look back at where you came from, so that morbidly obese Victoria yeah. who was on the couch, yeah, smoking, guzzling wine. When you look back at that, does that scare you a little bit that you could fall back into that if you if you sort of let off the gas a little bit? Every day, every day, I think that. Right. Yeah. And how does how do you respond to that? Um. I just keep moving forward. And, you know, I think that's probably part of what my struggle has been with my ankle injury over this last fall because Mm. it has sidelined me with the running and cycling. So I've been doing a lot, a lot of strength work and a lot of swimming and a lot of hiking. And, uh, but I think that is the biggest struggle I've had with the injury is the fear that I'm just going to fall all the way back to where I was. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just have to fight it. I don't have any good answer for you because sometimes all it takes is for me to have a good little 10 minute meditation in the morning and I get my head on straight and I'm good to go. And, you know, sometimes it's not so easy to get around that, but I do hold in my pocket the best thing that I've got from Iron Man. And that is just the absolute knowledge of what I'm capable of. Hmm. So, so it's following the plan, isn't it? But it's, yeah. it's fascinating that you say that, you know, you're, you're completely driven by this goal. And in a way, it's sort of the excitement, the adventure is driving you at the same time, the fear 
of falling back to where you came from. So that's sort of pushing you along this path. And at the same time, you're a human being. You know, you're pushing yourself through the limits. So you've picked up this ankle injury. Now you're in this stage where you have to kind of find this balance, which is the struggle, isn't it? Because, you know, you're an entrepreneur and an Ironman athlete, and we don't naturally, um, you know, understand words like patience or waiting yeah. for something. We would just want to go and do stuff, right? So you're kind of, it's interesting, you're reaching a, maybe a new stage in your, your Ironman journey, right? Where you're having to find this kind of like acceptance that you're not a machine, that yeah. you have to kind of like match all these things up and, you know, to become a better runner, maybe you need to do less, all those kind of things, right? So that's going to be a challenge, but you've got some big challenges on your horizon. I mean, this ad expedition length adventure that's, race. That's 2019. Right, are you, are you training already? You better get working because those aren't easy. No, no, that is for sure. And yeah, so that's what I got uh, last year starting my off season now. I got a mountain bike. And uh, so I'm getting out in the woods for these massive training sessions. I have, um, I'm an extreme organizer and planner. So I have my adventure binder beside me here on the desk with my calendar laid out for the next three years. And I know that there are certain things that need to happen to get me there, right? Like I want to do a hundred miler on a mountain bike. I want to do a 24 hour race. I want to do a 48 hour race. Um, I need to get some paddling certification, uh, different things like that. And plans are made and the weekends are marked in the calendar. And I'm also working with an adventure racing coach who I spend one weekend a month with in the off season up in Squamish. Mm -hmm. and uh, she puts me through my paces. I'm doing uh, navigation courses right now, uh, so I hopefully don't get too lost out there. And, uh, yeah, so it's it's the long game, but you know what? 2019 is not very far exactly. away, two years away, and uh, so, you know, I have it laid out around building that schedule around what my Ironman schedule is going to be. Very complimentary, I think. You have an impressive strategy to achieve these goals. I mean, we, we started at the top of the show talking about monster goals. And I'm thinking now about advice for people looking at what you're doing and thinking, well, how do I, you know, even have a slice of that action, do what Victoria is doing. So like with this adventure race, you have a binder, you have everything planned out for three years. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, it seems that you set a goal and you, then you go out and commit everything to that and plan around it. Can you give us some kind of detail about the actual process of what you do? Uh, well, it starts, yeah, I start with my big priorities. So I know next year I want to do two Ironmans and I've chosen what they are and those are in my calendar. Hmm. So, you know, I work with this big block. I set off, okay, this is where I'm going to be doing an Ironman build. And it's, it's a, basically a big spreadsheet. And then I make the list of all of the items that need to happen. Like I'm saying, I need some paddling certification before next February. That's going to take three weekends, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound like very much, but it kind of is because it's out of town. And uh, so I'm going, okay, so now I've got that organized and I, I plunk those things in there. So it's, it's like just this big puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I start with the big priorities. And work backwards. That's backwards. interesting, isn't it? And when you set these goals, do you find that you achieve them? Do you achieve them in the way that you want to achieve them? Or are you sort of kind of loose in the sense, I just want to do this, or, you know, I want to do an Ironman and do it in 13 hours? Or, I mean, are you quite specific with your goals? I'm, yes, I'm very specific with my goals. And I am not experienced enough yet or an advanced enough athlete yet to really have serious time frames around my goals. So when I do an expedition length adventure race, I am going to be looking to get across that finish line. Mm. And I think that's actually what makes getting to Kona the scariest goal I have because it's my first really big goal that is not about just getting it done. It's about performance. It like, you know, it's about getting a, a good enough result mm. that gets me there. So that is going to be, you know, me against other people as opposed to me against myself. Right. Yeah. 
that's the biggest, scariest thing to put out there that, you know, I'm going to be good enough to get there. Do you, do you think you might have bitten off more than you could chew? Does that thought ever cross your mind that you've set a too big a goal for you? Maybe you should scale it back. Um, I, I have thought that except for the maybe I should scale it back part. Right. That's, I'm just, uh, I'm an all in person. So I, I like to think big and I have moments of terror where I go, what have I done? <laughs> And, you know, uh, (laughs) but I think, and then I go, you know what, if I wasn't scared of this, it wouldn't be big enough. Hmm. So, and I'll tell you one thing that I am very good at, and that is failure. I do that lots, and, and it helps me lots. That's what gets me, that's what gets me to the goals. But if your goals aren't big enough to have a lot of failure thrown in there, Hmm. you know, I just think it's, it's not quite big enough for me. Right. Okay. Well, let's put that to the test. I want to. I want to paint a picture, paint a scene where Victoria Shannon, the endurance sports athlete, entrepreneur, and potential or future Ironman World Championship qualifier, sitting on the couch next to Victoria Shannon from a few years back, the morbidly obese smoker, probably just finished off a bottle of wine and a bowl of nachos. What's that conversation going to be like? Can you give us an insight into what you're going to say? I mean, are you going to tell old Vicky, sorry, old Victoria to do this, that and the other? Or is it going to be a different kind of conversation? It's going to be, Graham, a very short conversation. And if I could say one thing to anybody in the whole world or get one person to understand this, I would be so thrilled. And it's just this. Yes, you can. That's like, that was all I ever needed to know. And that's what Iron Man taught me. I think that the power of possibility and knowing, I don't even know what I'm capable of, but I'm capable of way more than I ever thought that I was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I go out looking for my limits all the time and I have yet to find them. But the power that I have that allows me to live this big, full, engaged, juicy life is simply because I know that I can. And when something comes up, like this Gobi Ultra, which has me absolutely fascinated, Mm -hmm. it never once occurred to me that I couldn't do it. I mean, it's going to be crazy work and crazy hard and lots of logistics and expensive and, and all of those things. But it never once occurred to me that I couldn't do it. So knowing what you can do is unbelievable power. Mm. And I used to not do things and not say things because I didn't think that I could do whatever, you know. So that's all I have to say is, yes, you can. And I, I so, you know, out of all of this change in my life, I really – want to find a way to be of service. And I think the way I can be of service is to make other people understand that other women in particular who don't do things out of fear or because they think they can't, because they can. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a great service to be, isn't it? To teach people through your own message, isn't it? Through your own life as an example and a role model. And especially, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm a guy, I don't have so much of an issue with this, but for women, there aren't as many positive role models as there are for men, right? You know, but we're seeing that change now. I mean, Iron Man's a great example, isn't it? Because media just doesn't give them the the coverage, right, in the years past. But now we have people like yourself and Steph Corker who can show other women that there is an alternative, right, to sitting on the couch and feeling bad for yourself, right? But yeah. where, where do I start? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm old Victoria Shannon here. Okay, look, you're going to go and race ultra in Gobi. You're going to qualify for Ironman in Kona. But here I am sitting on this couch, just finishing off my nachos and cheese. And you're telling me that I can do this? I don't believe you. What can I do here, right here, right now? Where can I start? What's the first step that I can make? I think the first... Step, and it certainly was for me and it's the commitment 
And um, yeah, you look at committing from nothing to an Ironman. Like I didn't even actually really know what I was committing to, mm -hmm. but I was committing to change. And I mean like full on commitment, like really heart and soul, everything in, even though you know there's going to be failures and you know how hard it's going to be like that commitment to it. And then it's just one step from there. And honestly, I start the first thing that I did in all of this was I just committed to drinking two liters of water a day and getting eight hours of sleep a night. Mm. And that was, that was the start. But I think the other big piece of it for me is, you know, circles back to what we were talking about before. It's the tribe. Yeah. It's, you know, find one person in your corner who you can talk to and, um, you know, who gets you and who will lift you up and support you. And, uh, you know, that will, it'll grow from there. It'll well, grow from there. You just have to make one step. You have to commit and then you just have to take one step forward. Love it. That's such great advice, isn't it? Those small steps, find one person in your corner and make a small commitment as well that you can, you can achieve, right? I mean, because that small commitment becomes the building block for you to do something else, right? You know, now you feel confident that you're drinking two liters of water a day, sleeping eight hours. It now becomes easier to say, okay, right, now I'm gonna start working out, right? Those, yep. That momentum that you're creating, I mean, that's key. I mean, I see that so much in what you've done and chasing these monster goals. And your story's been a real inspiration, Victoria. I'm so happy that you came on the show and shared it with us. Where do we find out more about you? Well, you can find me on Facebook at Victoria Wall Shannon. And my Instagram is Miss Vic without the I, so M S S V I C. And our website is B78AIM.com. Amazing. We'll put all the details in the show notes. That's Victoria Shannon, everybody, all the way from Victoria. BC in Canada. She's the president of Hans Braun Investments. She's also startup founder, entrepreneur, and as we said, wife, mom, grandma, artist, entrepreneur, adventurer, and we would like you to come back on a future show, Victoria, and share some of those adventures that you've talked about with us today, because I'm sure you're going to have something interesting to talk about six months, 12 months down the line. Yeah. Maybe it's not going to be Kona right here, right now, but there may be some other adventures that you have on your plate that you wish to talk about and some experiences that you want to share. Victoria, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Graham. It's been a real pleasure. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sport business. Find out more at www.endurancefm.com.